think the biggest answer is it's a distribution point. Mm -hmm. Everything home runs to one distribution point. And it is easily dressed and care the cable is cared for into the back of this distribution point and then everything is well numbered. So if I find Jack uh, D1 on a, on a, on a faceplate, then I can go to a patch panel and see number D1. So it's, a, it's for a point of distribution. Without that point of distribution, and I have 24 cables coming in, I have 24 cables that look like an octopus that have to get plugged into something versus put them, punch them to a patch panel where I have a clean distribution point. Uh, I think also when you, when you talk about the solid uh, cables, you know, each, each one is a solid cable, it's not stranded. It's not meant to be solid bent. Solid wire. Solid wire. Mm -hmm. It's not meant to be bent and bent and bent and you're pulling over here and you're pulling on the cable and after a while you're going to cause problems with that cable. Uh, plus, when I've seen people do that, it's usually because they want to save money. They say, well, I don't need a patch panel, I just put modular plugs on each cable and then write what number the cable is or, or not. Uh, and, and then what happens is after a couple of years and fooling around with it, the mod plugs fall off or you got to troubleshoot. And what you or need... Or the labeling fades away. Or the labeling fades away, <laughs> yes. And you usually spend more money fixing the problem or troubleshooting than you would have if you, you would have bought a patch panel and punched it down correctly and done it right and put those wires in nice and tight and organized and see they're easier to troubleshoot if you have a problem. And these type of cabling with, with this type of wire, you need what's called a gas tight connection. And so if you don't crimp properly where it grabs and grabs that wire securely in, in the mod plug, what happens is this oxygen gets between the two connections. And day one, it works great. Six months later, after that copper gets a little bit of tarnish on it, on a moist, a humid day or a rainy day, that's usually when we get the phone calls, um, what happens is uh, you get more resistance between the wires and you start to have issues and now you got to find out is it the neck card, is it the switch, uh, what is the problem here, only to find out that it's, it's an unprofessional install. And that's really what it is when you put mod plugs at the end of solid wire. It's an Usually you're cutting wire. those off and re cranking re them re later anyway. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so you run around chasing your tail on trying to find out what the problem is. You're going to spend more money on the long run and more time, more labor uh, putting on the mod plugs than you are going to uh, put in that professional patch panel and do it right the first time. I think that's a key word, Jim. I think it's professional. Professional. It's the professional way to do it. I, I don't think we would do it if a customer asked us to run the cables and just put mod plugs at the end. We wouldn't do it. And we could not warranty it for 15 years for sure, I know that because you're going to have problems with that. It's unprofessional, it's hard to troubleshoot, it's prone to problems. Yeah. Uh, I would say no. Um, yeah, you can get away with it and everything else, but when you punch down a cable into that, that little slot and it, and it looks like this, you push it in there, well when you pull the cable out, it doesn't go back. So the next time you punch in, it may not be as tight. Now, can you? Yes. You can use, reuse patch panels. Would we recommend it? Would I recommend it would be no. Well, again, you're going to spend more time troubleshooting it, replacing NICs, re buying new switches, uh, replacing computers, replacing patch cords, thinking that's your problem. So the, you know, and they're not even that expensive these days in the, you know, compared to what they used to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, you used to $500 for a 24-port patch panel. Uh, they've come down uh, tremendously in price. So it's a little bit of extra money at the front and you have that peace of mind when, you know, a year from now, two years, three years from now, I know it's not the patch panel, but if you reuse the patch panel, it's going to be the first thing that comes to your mind is I reuse that patch panel. That might be the problem. And those, once you punch down a patch panel, it's very difficult to troubleshoot it. If you don't get it right the first time, it's very difficult to troubleshoot. So if you have a bad port, you either have to try to pull that cable off Mm -hmm. while not disturbing all the other cables and move it further which usually means you don't have as much length on that cable so it's gonna you know you're gonna have to try to stretch it um, or you're just gonna have to mark it as a bad cable and run a whole new cable yeah, and it's been my experience over the years and this doesn't happen very often but if a technician is out troubleshooting a cable 
and they come back with bad port on the patch panel, it's usually because it was a reused patch panel. Yes, mm -hmm. almost every time. Yeah, and, and actually, when you think of it, the labor that's involved in punching all this cable down and then testing all the cables and then marking, uh, labeling all the, uh, uh, the jacks, and then you have one or two bad ports, then you have to redo the whole thing over again anyway. So it's really not, uh, the cost of the patch panel is, is immaterial compared to the labor that's involved to install the patch panel. Uh, no, crosstalk is not a factor in those cases, and it's the reason why is because of the twist in the cable um, uh, prevents the crosstalk. You know, are you going to get crosstalk sometimes if you don't do things right and things like that? Maybe. Uh, but the bottom line is running a bunch of cables uh, together uh, parallel, yeah. parallel uh, will not create crosstalk when there's twists in the cable, you know, twists within the individual cables. Um, now, if you're going to run two wires along uh, a path with no twists in it, you're going to get a ton of crosstalk, but the twist prevents the crosstalk. And I think the other issue, too, is I've seen before is people run 20, 50 cables together. They'll run them nice and neat, but then they'll take that tie wrap and they will just tighten them down as tight as possible. <laughs> and you can see the bundle goes like this, and then it shrinks, and then it, you know, it expands again. And, and that, is, that will cause problems. Well, that's more just from the physical damage of the cable itself. Mm -hmm. Correct. But the other, and maybe this is the question they're asking too, there is a such thing as alien crosstalk, which is not crosstalk from one pair within the same cable to another pair. It's crosstalk from another cable to one cable's pair, like brown pair, for instance, to another cable's brown pair. Now, the way uh, CAT6, which is a higher frequency than CAT5E, is set up is it's got a spine, and all our cable supply mm -hmm. cable has this. And this spine, in addition to the individual twist in the wire, the whole wire, kind of like in almost a quadruple helix uh, fashion, rotates as you go further along. So you don't have, for 50, 100 feet, two brown pairs right next to each other running along, um, causing crosstalk with each other. Um, but also the other thing to keep in mind too, the bundles, they don't go for all 100 feet right next to each other. There's some, you know, they trade places in and out. Pretty much once we get above into the ceiling, they're all over the place because it's just not practical to comb out an entire length of cable, nor would anyone want to pay for it because it would triple the labor in getting the cables out to each location for something that no one's ever going to see pretty much once you close up the ceiling tile. So we pretty much comb out the uh, visible portions of the cable. Um, and uh, that just that alone will set your installation above anyone else's. So I think but, you're you're absolutely right, and you you answered it perfectly. Even though you might have a bundle of cables that run parallel for 20 feet, there's no one pair in any of those cables that's running on the same edge for 20 feet next mm -hmm. to another pair mm -hmm. because they're all moving. So they're they're twisted themselves. But then each of the cables that are it's twisted, twisted. Uh, actually have a twist in the cable itself. That's correct. Mm -hmm. So even if you're toning out a cable, you will you could start toning and lose the tone and then pick the tone back up and then lose the tone and pick the tone back up because the pair that's on the tone is... Uh, explain twisted. what a tone is. That's a, a, a certain frequency generator, oscillator that you put on one end and then you have a receiver. So as you, as you test you can find the cable that, that's attached to that oscillator. Without having to touch the bare wire. Without having to touch Through the bare the wire. Through the insulation. Yeah. And we sell that on was Another thing too is rather than use tie wraps, because people tend to really tighten those down, this use uh, Velcro. Uh, Velcro. Uh, you can't get Velcro tight enough to damage the cable, but at the same time it keeps the cable in a nice thing. Plus when you have to add another cable, you have to cut all these tie wraps, you just add the cable and, and redo the Velcro. So, um, you know, and you know, one practical thing that you're not going to see in books or, or people um, explain it is if they're teaching it is you always want to put a service loop in the ceiling. Mm -hmm. And a service loop is an extra two, you know, one to two feet of loop in the ceiling. And the only reason you do that is every once in a while someone asks you to move that <laughs> patch panel and you have the extra space. You can, you can undo the service loop and give you more 
cable. And you always want to pull more cable than you expect to use. So, um, you know, because the most expensive cable on earth is the cable that's one foot or one inch too short. And then you and, have to and that, that brings up another point mm -hmm. that people will ask, well, how much cable do I need? You could mm -hmm. always plan on 10% of, at least 10% of that cable is going to be waste. It's going to be waste, yeah. Because you're going to have to pull it a little bit longer on both sides and you'll eventually end up trimming that cable on both ends, so. I actually think more. I, I when we, when I look at a box of 1,000-foot cable, I think of about 800-foot, which is useful, and a, uh, the rest is probably throwaway because then you end up with a box that has 60 feet in it, but all your pulls are 150, and you're not going to waste your time even trying that, or even 100-foot left in a box, you're not going to waste your time pulling that if it's 110 foot away, and you really don't know sometimes. So you really got to bring it down the wall, bring it out of ways more than you need, and you're going to have a scrap there. You're going to have scrap in the box that you can't use. So it's about 800 foot uh, of useful cable in a thousand foot uh, box. And at the same time, I know some people from our videos have said, oh, you're wasting cable here, wasting cable there. It's really not wasted because what we turn around and do is we turn it into a recycle company and they recover that copper and then they, of course, uh, give us uh, a portion of that uh, recovery back in So you've gone green. Well, we've gone green as much as possible. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, anything that saves money, we go green. Well, that's for the professional installer. Uh -huh. The home installer probably can get more than 800 feet out of a thousand foot box as far as usefulness because mm -hmm. labor is not as expensive for the home. Actually, it's infinitely less expensive. It's free for the home installer. <laughs> um, we have to balance the material versus the labor. If our guys spend two or three extra hours per location trying to save a foot, ten foot, then we're losing money and the customer's mm -hmm. having to pay more for it. So from a um, from a financial point of view as a professional installer, 800 feet is useful out of a thousand feet. If you're going to be doing this for your home, you could probably get a lot more usage out of a thousand foot box because you're going to be willing to spend the time to get it exactly right to begin with and to um, save as much as possible. So there is, it can be less, but for the professional installer, 800 feet is a good guide, I think. This seems to wrap up all the questions that we have, or at least the time we have for these questions. So if you have any other questions, we'll be doing this from time to time. Uh, please send us your questions. If there are a question that you have, most likely someone else has the same question. So therefore, you you know, it'll help others and other individuals who are curious about the subject that you're asking about. Please visit our website, um, www.cablesupply.com, and we have a lot of YouTube videos that will actually show you the details of how to cable your house or, or your commercial building. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for the questions.